I invite you to open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Mark today. Mark chapter 4, if you will locate that. If you have found the text in a moment, we'll start to make our way verse by verse through this text. But I'd like to briefly pray and ask God to bless now our time in His Word. Let's pray together. And now, Lord, we pray that Your Word will be effective. We thank You, as Peter says, we are born again not of perishable seed, but by imperishable seed, the enduring Word of God. And so may that Word be effective today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Four of the most powerful words in the English language are once upon a time. Say those words and fidgety little ADD eight-year-olds will drop their Legos and listen. Say those words and old women who have Alzheimer's who are lost in a sea of nothingness will sit up and listen and may even smile as they hear a familiar tale. Eugene Peterson says that stories are a verbal act of hospitality. That's very true. Some stories, they they entertain us. Some stories inform us. But the best of stories reach us. And they stick with us. You, You ever find yourself reading a book and you get to the last page at the end of the book and, and you get to the end and you close the book and you feel sad? Or you watch a movie about things that aren't even true and you, you, you walk out of the theater feeling a little bit more brave than when you walked in? My, my favorite movie of all time is an Italian film, La Vita e Bella. Life is beautiful. It's about a family in a concentration camp in World War II. And every time I watch that movie... I have to choke back my tears. Now, how is it that fake people in a fake world can produce such real emotions? That is the power of a story. Our world is filled with many story lovers, but not many good storytellers. But I'm convinced that the greatest storyteller of all time was none other than Jesus of Nazareth, because his stories stick with us. And the story we'll see today, many of us heard as a child in Sunday school or from our parents, and it still is embedded somewhere deep within us. As we come to Mark chapter 4 today, we find a collection of some of Jesus' best stories, and we're introduced to what I'm calling the Son and His Parables. We'll see some today and some in the weeks ahead. Now, our passage this morning, Mark 4, 1 through 20, includes one specific parable, and we're going to see that. But it also includes an explanation by Jesus about why he teaches this way. So, this is a little bit, it's like, (laughs) this is like staring at two mirrors at the same time. What you have this morning is a parable about parables. In fact, Jesus tells us, if you're going to catch anything, He says you've got to catch this first parable. Skip down, if you will, to verse 13. Look what Jesus says. Do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? So this is not just a story. Think of today's story as a key that unlocks Jesus' best stories. And so it is no accident that the very first parable that we encounter from Jesus here is the parable of the sower and the seed and the soils. If you've ever found Jesus' parables mysterious and curious, first of all, welcome to the club. But second of all, listen closely because this passage will help you not only understand these great stories better, but it will help you understand this great storyteller better. In the passage before us, Mark gives to us what I'm calling three revelations. Because this is new information to the disciples and, and really helpful to us. Three revelations about Jesus and His parables. And if you're going to understand this part of Jesus' ministry, you have to catch 
what he tells us here. I'll summarize them and we'll work through the text together. The first revelation that we have in verses 1 through 9 is, number one, that all people should listen to Jesus and his parables. All people should listen to Jesus and his parables. Notice how the scene begins, verse 1. Jesus, he began to teach again by the sea. And such a very large crowd gathered to him that he got into a boat in the sea and sat down, and the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. So Jesus, we're here at the the, the Sea of Galilee, a familiar place in his ministry here. And notice in verse 1 closely it says, such a very large crowd gathered. The, The original here may be implying that of all the crowds Jesus has seen, this is the largest crowd yet. This one is huge. And the last time, remember, Jesus' fear was that the crowd was going to crush him. So this crowd is so big, this mass is so massive, Jesus has to get creative in his presentation. So he climbs into a boat and sits down. You you, you have this scene here where the, the shoreline provides sort of a natural crowd control. The boat becomes his platform, the wooden stern becomes his pulpit, and the the, the water and the, the natural geography becomes a natural amphitheater, and Jesus begins to preach. So what does he preach? Verse 2, And he was teaching them many things in parables, and he was saying to them in his teaching. We'll pick up there in a moment. He tells us that his preaching at this occasion included parables. Now, popularly defined, parables are earthly stories that illustrate a heavenly truth. I think that's helpful. We could be more precise than that. But generally speaking, they're earthly stories that that illustrate, they teach us some heavenly truth. It's a story you recognize to teach you a truth you may not recognize. And it attaches this abstract concept to something familiar. And it illuminates what you didn't know otherwise. Now, before we look at this parable, notice how Jesus bookends this parable. Look at verse 3, if you will. It says in verse 3, the very first word there is the word listen. And then look, if you will, at the end of verse 9. At the end of verse 9, the very last word that Jesus gives is the word hear. So the first word and the last word is listen and hear. And this comes from the same Greek word. It sounds familiar to us. It's the word akuo, from which we get the word acoustics. Jesus says, you need to pay attention. You need to hear. Listen up, he says. Now, we often think of hearing as something passive, right? I mean, if a a baby cried in this room, you wouldn't do anything to recognize that. The baby would cry, and sound waves would get pushed through the air, and it would hit your eardrums, and it would rattle through, and your brain would interpret it, and you'd go, oh, a baby's crying. But you didn't do anything, right? You You just heard it. It's passive in that sense. But that's not what Jesus is calling us to do. He's calling us to listen in an active, spiritual sense. It's a lot closer to, you ever, think, you, ever, you ever think that you have a mouse in the walls of your house? Or like a critter in the attic? Right? You know what you do? You, you, you go in and, you know, the kids, my kids, I'm saying, shh, everybody be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. And we go up to the wall and you put your ear on it. And for some reason you close your eyes. I don't know why you close your eyes, but <laughs> people start moving. Shh, stop it, quit, 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 quit. And you lean in and you practically hold your breath. And you're, you concentrate on every tiny sound. That's what Jesus wants us to do with his parables. Is to give acute attention to what he's saying. Because of how important and significant it is. Listen and consider. So what do we consider? Well, let me tell you the story. Verse 3, Jesus says, Behold, the sower went out to sow. So Jesus gets on a boat, the crowd finally quiets down, the water is slowly kind of washing up on the shore there, but it's relatively calm and quiet as everyone looks at Jesus. Jesus sits at the end of the boat, and Jesus opens his mouth and he says, Once upon a time, there was a farmer. And that's how the story started. 
Now, when we think of farmers, we think of John Deere tractors and big combines and silos and all that. But the story Jesus tells here was much more common than what we think of as farming. In fact, almost everyone in his crowd had not only seen this, most of them had probably done it. They had taken seed and sown the seed. Jesus says that's what he does. He went out to sow some seed. Literally, he takes some some seed. Food comes from crops, and crops come from plants, and plants come from seeds, and seeds must be sown. The seed must be entombed in the dirt in order for anything to happen. And so the farmer has to take the seed and fling it, to broadcast it. He has to to, to throw it out there. So what's going to happen? Verse 4, as he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate it up. The farmer flings the seed in this first little group, it hits the ground. But, but like tiny little billiard balls, they, they skip across the earth. You see, this earth is hard. It's pressed in. There's no welcome mat here for the seed. The seeds tumble and fumble and they roll across the ground and eventually they stop, but they stop on top of the dirt. They stop exposed. And, and, and there all of a sudden, this grain seed becomes bird feed. And the bird swoop down, it says, and begins to, to eat it. The combination of the hard ground and the hungry bird means that this seed has no chance of bearing fruit. That's the first seed. The farmer plunges his calloused hands back into the bag and notice verse 5, other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched and because it had no root, it withered away. Now, these seeds do better than the last group, but not by much. This seed is caught and cushioned, if you will, by a a thin layer of black topsoil. It doesn't skip or bounce. It, It actually finds a place. It sticks into the ground, and that's a good sign. And there it comes to that ground, and this seedling quickly becomes a little sproutling. A little tiny green shoot makes its way up. And that looks good, but not for long. Because just a a quarter of an inch, if you will, below the dirt, all there is is gravel and rocks and pebbles all tightly packed together. And the roots of that shootling go down, but they don't go very far. And that which sprang up burns up. For it was scorched, Jesus said. It's the perfect recipe for disaster. Too much sun, too little soil, too little water. And it dies. The next seed comes in verse 7. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Now this seed gets further than the first two. It finds soil, it germinates, the shoot comes up, it begins to make its way, its journey from seed to plant. And man, this seed really looks good. But even plants have natural predators. And the thorns, which are a cursed byproduct of the fall, these thorns, almost like a violent gang, hunt down this innocent little shoot and they attack it. As if with bare hands the thorns grab the plant by its fleshy throat and squeeze and tighten and choke the very life out of it. And the plant dies. If the first seed was kidnapped, the second seed dehydrated... And this third seed, you might say, was murdered. Now, if you're keeping score, this poor farmer, he's 0 for 3. That's not very good, but old MacDonald is not done yet. So notice verse 8. Other seeds fell into the good soil. And as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced 30, 60, and 100 fold. Ah, finally. This is the point when Jesus told the story and everybody in the crowd went, Whew, okay, good. Finally, something good came out of this story. It doesn't seem like it, but it finally does. Jesus says the words in verse 8 that every farmer loves to hear. Look at verse 8 closely. He says things like good soil and increase and yield and crop and produce. That's a farmer's love language. All his hard work has paid off. The seed makes a plant, the plant grows up, and it produces a crop and food, and the farmer's work has paid off. The story here is quite realistic. Maybe the only thing that's not realistic is the the yield at the end. Some scholars point out that a 30-fold crop would have been very healthy. A 60-fold crop would have been like a -a once-in-a-lifetime produce. And a 100-fold crop, that could only be called miraculous. 
So that's the parable. That's the story. A farmer plants his garden, and normal gardening stuff happens. And after all that, Jesus punctuates it with verse 9, and he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, isn't that a little bit odd? At that point in the story, he stops and he says, every single person needs to hear that story. As normal and as mundane as it seems, that story is critically important. Everyone needs to consider it. If you're a child here this morning and you have ears, you need to listen. If you're a teenager and you have ears, Jesus says, you need to listen to this. A man, woman, doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, Jesus says, you need to listen to this. And by the way, there's nearly two billion ears on planet Earth who have yet to hear this. So Jesus says, we, we need to hear this story. But he doesn't just mean let it echo through the, 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 the air and into your eardrum. When Jesus says, we need to hear this, it's not just hear it. He means to heed, to hear and heed it. To listen and obey what he's saying. To perceive, to consider closely what he's doing. Why? Because if you remember back in verse 2, it says Jesus was teaching them in parables. There is a lesson in this, Jesus says. So the question is, do you get the lesson? Jesus' teachings, they were entertaining, but they were not entertainment. There's something for us. So let me ask you, did you get it? You say, oh yeah, because the seed represents and the soul represents. No, 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 no. You can't go there yet. You have to feel what the disciples felt. At this point, this is all they had. And Jesus says, you better listen to what I'm saying. So if that's all you had, would you get it? Would you perceive the message? You say, probably not. Well, that leads us nicely into the second revelation. Because the second revelation in verses 10 to 13, not only should all people listen, but number two, some people will understand Jesus and his parables. All people should listen to Jesus and his parables, but only some people will understand Jesus and his parables. You, you, you ever find yourself, you ever hear a joke and everybody kind of chuckles and you're sitting there thinking, why is that funny? You know? It's kind of like a poem. Remember when you're in sixth grade and the teacher would read a poem and the teacher would go, isn't that amazing? And you're thinking, what does that mean? Or you see, you go to an art gallery and you see a piece of art and people are like crying. Oh, look at that beautiful. And you're thinking, it's a red dot. What are you talking about? Why is that amazing? You know? What's true of punchlines and poems and paintings is also true of parables. Just because you see it or hear it doesn't, doesn't mean you get it. And Jesus says some people understand, others won't. Look at verse 10. As soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables. This gives the impression that sometime later in the day, the disciples came to Jesus. You ever sit in class and you want to ask a question but you don't want to look stupid? That's the disciples here. They, they kind of wait till Jesus is alone and they come and they say, okay, you, you said we better hear this. We all heard it. We don't get it. What, what does this mean? So Jesus gives them an answer. He explains to them why he teaches in this way. Now, what Jesus is about to say, I'm going to be honest, is a little bit difficult. So be prepared. He says in verse 11, as he was saying to them, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, everything is in parables, so that while seeing they may see and not perceive, and while hearing they may hear and not understand, otherwise they might return and be forgiven. Jesus says, I teach in parables for two reasons. To reveal and to conceal. For the spiritual insiders... The parable reveals the truth. For the spiritual outsiders, the parable conceals the truth. The same parable softens some people 
and hardens others. The same parable that that illuminates some blinds others. And Jesus says, this is why I teach this way. You, verse 11, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. In other words, to those who sought after Jesus, who responded, who heard this, and they wanted to know more, he says, I'm going to give you the mystery. I'm going to reveal this. I'm going to show you the secret. I'm going to explain this to you because you've come to me. It wasn't disclosed before, but I will give that to you because you guys are inside. You're the ones who are closest. You're the ones who want to know, and so I'll give it to you. The disciples here, everybody in this crowd watched the movie, but only the disciples watched the director's cut, if you will. They they got to know all the nuances because they, they came to Jesus to find out more. But he says, to those who are outside, everything is given in parables. You remember those who were outside? His family was outside. The scribes have been outside. Jesus says they hear these parables, and even though they hear it, They don't understand it. And even though they see it, they don't perceive it. I heard heard one commentator explain it this way. He said, parables are meant to keep outsiders on the outside. He said, it's kind of like a, a, he described it as a political cartoon. You ever, you know, you know the newspaper, these political cartoons after an event or something happens, you see these, they share it on Facebook and so forth. And he, he, he described it this way. He said, imagine you were from another planet or you know, another country. You knew nothing about America, nothing at all about America. And you picked up a political cartoon and you looked at it and you would think to yourself, now why is this elephant and donkey wearing boxing gloves? And who's that old guy with the red, white, and blue hat in the background? If you didn't know anything about it, you'd, you'd, and the more you looked at it, you would think, what does that mean? Why do donkeys and elephants, they don't fight? Like, what is that? You know? And the harder you tried to get it, the less sense it would make. But if you know America and politics and the symbolism and the code, you read it and it makes sense. You get the message. And for those who are inside, they understand the mysteries, the secrets of the kingdom. Those who are outside do not. In many ways, it seems Jesus is quoting here from Isaiah chapter 6. He's picking up on what God was doing with Israel in those days. In, in those days, if you remember, God came through Isaiah to the people and He told them to return to Him, to look to Him, to listen to Him. And the people rejected Him. And so in Isaiah chapter 6, God, God had told them, if you don't listen to me, I'm going to send you into exile. And they don't listen to Him. And so Isaiah keeps preaching, but by that point he says, even though he's preaching, you're going to hear him, but you're not going to perceive. You're going to hear him, but you're not going to understand because I told you you're going to go into exile, and the more you hear his message, the less you want it, and therefore my sovereign plan of you going into exile will come about. You will go into exile as I promised. And in some ways it seems here that the the, the scribes, for instance, are those in one sense who come to Jesus. And even though, remember the story we just finished, the the, the, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, they, they, they come to Jesus and they don't understand and they came down because they were going to curse Jesus and to reject Jesus. And then when they hear Jesus, it doesn't enlighten them, but because their mind was already made up in that sense, it further blinds them. And remember, these are scribes from where? From Jerusalem, which means they probably had a hand in Jesus' eventual crucifixion, which was the plan of God. And so just as it happened in Isaiah's day, that you're going to hear it but not get it because the plan of going into exile is going to take place, so too these are going to hear it and not get it because the plan of the crucifixion is going to take place. One preacher said parables conceal in order to reveal because the kingdom is an open secret. My friends, this is a great reminder to us, and I think we all need to catch this. It is another reminder to us that salvation is not fundamentally an intellectual issue. You cannot just argue people into the kingdom of God. We say, I'm going to give them evidence and history and archaeology and all this, and then they'll believe. Listen, I'm not, those things are not wrong. We should use those as much as possible and as well as possible. But sometimes the more evidence you give somebody, the harder their heart gets. You say, that's not fair. 
That's Romans 9. Did you catch it earlier? You don't get to say that about God. If you are the clay, you're the clay. He's the potter. And Romans 9 is reminding us, listen, if you are here this morning and you are not a, and you are a believer, you are a Christian, please understand, it's not because you are smart and not because you are wise and not because you are better than other people. It is because God was merciful to you. Our doctrinal statement says it well. Only the grace of God can bring man into his holy fellowship. It's by God's grace that insiders get the secrets and make sense of them. And it's in the same way only outsiders get the parables and can't make sense. You say, Pastor, I don't understand that. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. So here's the question. Do you want to be an insider or an outsider? Now hopefully you're thinking, but I want to be an insider. I don't don't like to be left out of secrets or, you know, jokes or anything. I want to be inside. Well, good. Because that leads us to the third revelation. It leads us exactly to Jesus' point. Revelation number one, all people should listen. Revelation two, some people will understand. Revelation number three, each person is culpable for their response to Jesus and His parables. Each person is culpable for their response to Jesus and His parables. Now, let me tell you up front, Jesus is going to teach us right here this. The ground determines what becomes of the seed. That's His message. That's the big idea here. This isn't a different sower each time. This isn't a different grade quality seed. This isn't a different environment. It's all those are the same. The difference in each case is the soil. And the soil represents a different response to Jesus and his and his message. In fact, I I think I think I wish I had all day to talk about this. I think what Mark is doing here is so brilliant. When I preach Matthew, people say, what's your favorite gospel? I say Matthew. Now I'm preaching Mark. I'm like, man, Mark's my favorite gospel. You know, the more I get into it, the more amazed I am. If you've been keeping up with Mark, there's something happening here. As you go through three, these first three chapters, this story comes at the perfect time in Mark's gospel. Because if you've been paying attention, you get to chapter 3, and you'd be if you'd never read Mark before, you'd, you'd get to chapter 3 and go, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. Jesus is a religious leader, but all the religious leaders hate him. And Jesus is a son and a brother, but his own family doesn't believe in him. That's, that's backwards. And the only people who do believe in him and love him are tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners. And you would get to the end of chapter 3 and be scratching your head going, this is such a weird, this is not the way the story is supposed to go. And Mark says, I know. But that's how the kingdom works. And he gives us the parable of the soil so we can make sense of those first three chapters. He is telling us, no, no, no. This makes perfectly good sense when you understand what people are doing when they hear the word. So what's he telling us? Verse 14, the sower sows the word. No doubt this directly applies to Jesus himself, right? Let's start there. Before we get to us, start in Jesus' day. Mark is telling us, this is what Jesus has done, that Jesus has been spreading the seed-like word of the kingdom. Everywhere he goes, he is broadcasting the message. He is throwing this around in every synagogue he's at. He is throwing it around on top of every crowd that stands before him. He is constantly telling them, repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus is spreading this message far and wide. Now, very soon, he's going to send out his disciples to preach, and so they become sowers. And then in the Great Commission, he sends us out, and we become sowers. So this isn't only limited to Jesus, but it's a reminder to us that this is the mission that God has called us to do. That's why Paul says, I planted and Apollos watered. But God gave the increase. Our job was the planting, the sowing, the watering. 
You see, God has ordained the end as well as the means to that end. And we confidently do the sowing because God will assuredly do the growing. But when we share Jesus, when we share His Word, we should be prepared that people will respond differently. And church, this is why, understand me closely, that success for us as a church is not nickels and noses, it is faithfulness to spreading the Word of Christ. That's our task. So, what happens? Verse 15, these are the ones, the first group, these are the ones who are beside the road where the word is sown, and when they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. By the way, notice in that verse 15, it says there that when they hear, okay, now catch this. This is true in all four of these seed scenarios. They hear, they hear, they hear, they hear. See, sometimes we come to this story and we, we, we don't listen, we don't pay attention to what's actually going on here. We read this story and we see those first three groups of people and we say, oh, that's all the people who decide to go to the lake for the weekend. That's all those degenerate people who are out playing sports or doing other things on Sunday morning. No, it's not. It's churchgoers. It's people hearing the word. That's what he's talking about. And the question is, how are they going to hear the word? And in this first group, it says that their heart is hardened like asphalt. It's impervious. And the word just sits on the surface, if you will. They're so unresponsive that the the word of God, the message just seems to bounce off their ears, to bounce off their life, to make no effect and no impact. Now, they might be hard-hearted. I think another way to think of it, they might just be tough-minded. Some people want more than just some fluffy feel-good stories. They're, They're really, truly, honestly thinking about things, and often the Word maybe doesn't answer every question or thought they have, and the Word sort of bounces off. And Jesus says, and eventually the birds show up, and the birds represent Satan here, and Satan comes, and he snatches it away. So this group not only hears the message, but they also hear Satan's lies. Like a bird, Satan comes and he crows in our ears and he chirps at us and says, God is not real and hell is not fair and the Bible is not true. And even though we're hearing the message, those things come in, swoop in and take the word from us. Church, this is a reminder to us that sharing the gospel is spiritual warfare. Teaching the Bible to your children is not just downloading information into their brains so that they stay off drugs and don't get pregnant. Their soul is at stake, Jesus says. And the devil hates it when you pray with your children. He hates it when you share a Christian book with a friend. He hates it when when a husband and wife discusses the sermon at at lunch after church. He, He hates those things. He would rather you think about chores and football and vacation and your to-do list and everything else. And if need be, he will bring whatever he can to snatch the word out of your mind. So it doesn't bear fruit. The second response, 16, in a similar way, look at your Bibles. These are the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, who when they hear the word immediately receive it with joy. And they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. Then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. So these people hear the word. And initially they respond well. They might raise their hand when the preacher asks. They might walk an aisle. They might even get baptized. They might have the appearance of good soil, but time will prove otherwise. This is like many in the crowds that came to Jesus, if you remember. They were like bandwagon fans. They'll hang in there as long as Jesus is feeding them, as long as Jesus is healing them, as long as Jesus is amusing them, as long as going to to church is easy and fun, as long as... Sunday school and and listening, as long as it kind of reinforces the stuff I already think, then by all means, but once affliction or persecution arises, because of the word, they fall away. They don't mind saying amen on Sunday, but they don't want to take it to work on Monday because people will think less of them. 
If you are only loyal to Jesus in good times and not bad times, i got news for you, you're not loyal to Jesus. The cancer of the modern church is consumerism. Thinking that, well, we only want it when it's going to, to make my life better and it's going to enhance who I am. Sometimes obeying God's Word will bring difficulty to your family. Sometimes it will make things incredibly hard at Thanksgiving. Sometimes it will bring you to a point, to a decision where others will turn their back on you. But Jesus says that's why you need to have deep roots. You need deep roots in a Sunday school class and deep roots in in, in serving the church and deep roots entangled in the lives of those around you. Because if you don't have those deep roots, when some kind of wind of difficulty comes, you will be blown away. And Jesus says it's because they don't have the depths. They fall away. I've said before, you cannot lose your salvation, but you sure can fake it. And these, it seems, have that appearance, but there is no root. Verse 18, and others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word, but the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. This third group, their problem is not crows and birds called the devil swooping down. They are attacked in a much more subtle way. Birds swoop down in an instant. Thorns take time to grow. And if we don't pluck them out early on, they will take root. And they will spring up very subtle in our lives. We don't think it's a big deal. We don't think anything's wrong. We don't even perceive it because the growth is so slow on our hearts. There are so many things competing for your attention right now. And Jesus says these are the ones that they, that these things come into their life. And so you come to church and you hear the word and God says that we are to be generous with our money. But we walk out of church and we think of that boat we could buy or the bigger house or we think of the the corner office and the deceitfulness of riches snatches away, chokes out the word. We hear the sermon about taking the message to the ends of the earth and we think to ourselves, man, maybe I, should, maybe I should go on that mission trip. Maybe I should give two years after college and go to the mission field. And then the worries of the world set in and we think, what would I do for money? What, what would I do for this? And I don't think that I can do this. And besides planes crash, there's no way I could go. And the worries of the world choke it out. And then Jesus gets really generic. The desire for other things. That's whatever you want it to be. My friend, that thing that you desire more than Christ is not just called a hobby, it is called idolatry. Worldliness is alive and well, materialism is alive and well, idolatry is alive and well, and they are all competing for your attention and your devotion right now. And they don't smack you in the head like a two-by-four. If anything, they slowly grow on you and around you. And before you know it, they smother and choke you out. And then verse 20, And those are the ones on whom seed was sown on the good soil. And they hear the word and accept it. And bear fruit thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. Notice the difference in the first three, all three of those soils, they heard the word, they heard the word, they heard the word. But notice this last soil, they hear the word and accept it. This soil welcomes the seed. They find Jesus and his teachings and they embrace them for themselves personally. They take it in and they process it and they think on it. How can I live this out? How can I learn this? And they embrace these things. And the way we know that they accept it is because he says in verse 20, they bear fruit. They don't just hear Jesus say, repent and believe. They actually repent and believe. They don't just expect others to do it. It starts with them. My friends, true faith produces lasting fruit. 
This person not only trusted Jesus, but they keep on trusting Jesus. That's why he says, abide in me and you will bear much fruit. This person is growing in their character and their virtue. This is a person who is making a point to read their Bible. They may struggle, certainly, but they want to memorize God's Word. They're, they try to be intentional in their prayer life, and they look for others to serve. They, 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 they try out the spiritual disciplines of fasting and meditating and being generous and silent and to think of these things, and they want to grow in the image and the likeness of Christ, and it begins to bear that kind of fruit, and they look different than they did when they started out. My friends, a fruitless faith is a worthless faith because the fruit proves the root. Good soil, here's the good news and the good book, and they bear good fruit. So the question is, what kind of soil are you? He who has ears, let him hear. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Now may your word find good soil May it be implanted deep within our thoughts and our minds and our imaginations and may it be received by the soil of faith and may it spring up. We thank you, Father, that your word will not return void, but it will accomplish what you intend. And so may it do that even now. We pray that the devil would not have opportunity to snatch the word. Help us to chop down the thorns of worldliness and materialism that want to choke out the Word. Help us not to have shallow roots by which we would be scorched, but may our faith and our soil be good to hear it, to accept it, and to bear fruit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.